Right, well, the first case of the COVID-19 subvariant that's uh, currently the dominant strain in the U.S. Uh, has been uh, confirmed in South Africa. The XBB1.5 uh, has uh, been detected by Stellenbosch University's network for genomics surveillance. Uh, the National Department of Health says that uh, they have been alerted about the variant, which has been described as the most transmissible subvariant to date. Uh, the health department says that uh, they're currently in discussions uh, with scientists to gather more information about the variant including its trans uh, transmissibility and severity. The director at the Center for Epidemiology at the University of uh, Stellenbosch, Professor Tulio de Oliveira, uh, joins us now. Prof, a very good afternoon to you and thank you very much for joining us. Um, good afternoon, Sakina, and good afternoon for all your viewers. All right, it's it's flow. In in simple terms, what what does, right. what does the process <laughs> what does the process of uh, gene sequencing entail? I do believe you know you were part of uh, the team, and I've certainly been taking a look at some of uh, your social media uh, interaction. There, uh, you were part of the team at Stellenbosch University who carried out who carried this this out, w which of course helped uh, in the discovery. But you know, just for simple terms, for us who don't really mm, understand uh, the science behind behind it all. Talk to us about what this process of gene sequencing really does entail. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so South Africa has one of the most advanced uh, genomic sequencing programs in the world, yeah. We started in March 2020. This is even before the first case hit South Africa. We are prepared to do genomic surveillance. That was funded by our Department of Science Innovation. And what we do in reality is not only Stellenbosch University. We have nine labs around the country, including at University of KwaZulu Natal, at the NICD, and many other settings in South Africa that every week do genomic surveillance. What it means every week, we selected uh, uh, around 100 uh, random selected samples from the country, yeah, and then we describe which variant it is, it is circulating in South Africa. We release a report every Friday that go to our Department of Health and other departments of our government, yeah, and so last Friday we All right, I hope we haven't uh, lost him there on the line. Um, we'll certainly uh, be trying to uh, get him back on the line while the team just works on that. Uh, just let's uh, talk about uh, this uh, variant at uh, this time. Of course, what we are hearing is that it is the first case of uh, the sub uh, variant uh, that's uh, currently dominant um, a strain in the US and it has been confirmed um, in South Africa. But we do have our guest uh, back, Professor Tulio de Oliveira speaking to us about the first case of the COVID-19 sub uh, variant that's uh, currently the dominant uh, strain in the, in the U.S. that has been uh, confirmed in uh, South Africa. And of course, he was uh, part of the team at Stellenbosch University uh, who certainly made uh, that uh, discovery. Thanks uh, very much for staying with us. Unfortunately, we lost each other there. I hope, uh, you know, we can communicate a bit at this uh, time. Uh, Prof, we were talking about what the process of gene sequencing entails. And I said, if you can talk to us about it in, you know, in, in terms that we can uh, certainly understand and um, as, as laymen, because we don't understand the scientific way uh, that you'd be talking about, but what, what does this process of gene sequencing entail that helps you make this particular discovery? We'll just ask you to unmute yourself, uh, Prof. Yeah. yeah, the process of gene sequencing, it's basic. We use the same sample that's used to do a diagnostic of COVID. What it means, a nasal swab, yeah. We take that swab and then we sequence the genome of the virus of the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that cause COVID, yeah. And then we identify mutations which allow us to identify the exact variant that's circulating, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a large program in South Africa. It involves hundreds of scientists and nine key labs that are distributed across the country in almost every province. And we do that every week. And so last week or yesterday, we found the first genome of Omicron. It's still Omicron, yeah. but it's this new set 
lineage of Omicron that's causing a surge of infection at the east coast of the United States of America, yeah. more specific in New York. Yeah. Uh, Prof, what makes you, and I want to put this <laughs> in an articulate way as I possibly can, but what makes you suspect uh, that there is, you know, this new var variant? What, what, um, what triggers scientists to, to make this research? What triggers you to sort of um, do this gene sequencing that, that, that made you discover that there is uh, essentially this, the, the, this new uh, a vari a variant? Or do you, are you just randomly uh, just sort of making these sort of uh, discoveries? What triggers it? Okay, so, so South Africa has, has a very... Um, a very strong system of genomic surveillance, not only for COVID, but for many other pathogens. Yeah. And every week we select around like 100 to 200 random selected samples across the country. And we generate the, yeah. this knowledge or the genome within a few days of turnaround time. Why do we do that? We do that because just to make sure that our diagnostics are still effective, that our vaccines are still effective, and that if you find something unusual that's likely to cause a wave of infection, yeah, that we have time to prepare the health system. Yeah. So that's what we call as an early warning, so we know what's coming in our way. In the case of the Omicron BXBB 1.5, we only got one of 100 genomes, so it's in very low prevalence. And at the moment, we don't have any concern that this will fuel another wave of infection. In case the prevalence start growing very fast and also the number of cases and hospitalizations, which we think that's extremely unlikely to happen, yeah. then we will make sure that via the Department of Science and Innovation that fund our work and the Department of Health, that, that, that the public will be properly informed. But at the moment, we like to say that we are alerted about this new variant, but we are not concerned that will cause major problem in South Africa. All right. Well, that's great news, certainly for us uh, to hear, because that was the next uh, part of my question as to how concerned uh, we should be. But apart from it being, um, you know, highly transmissible, as, as, as we've been told, how different is it really from uh, the other um, Omicron variants that, that, that we've been, um, you know, subjected to or that we've been, uh, been seeing? Um, but apart from that, the back of my question, the other part of my question is um, the vaccines. How effective are they uh, for this particular variant? You know, we, we, we're telling people to get their booster shots and so forth. Um, will they work for this uh, variant that, that, that is, has, has now been uh, discovered? Okay, thank you, Flo. Yeah, so, so, so the vaccines will still be very effective, yeah. Why that? This is still Omicron, is not very different than any of the hundreds of different Omicron lineage. Mm -hmm. And many of your public will remember that it is around May of last year, around eight months ago, we had a, our last wave of infection. And with the level of population immunity in South Africa, because vaccination and previous infection, that wave was not deadly. What it means did not fill our hospitals and did not cause large excess deaths. So with this new lineage of Omicron, which we call XBB 1.5, because it's still Omicron, did not get another Greek name because it's not a different variant. Yeah. The vaccines will be highly effective as it is showing in, for example, in New York at the moment, they have like at least six times less hospitalization on people that have been vaccinated than the ones that did not have vaccinated. Eh? And that's why it's important, especially for the, the public that's concerned about another wave of infection, which we, we think that will not be large in South Africa. We don't think that we're going to need any restrictions. That's our current assumption. Mm -hmm. But for the people that's concern, our suggestion, it is to get a booster because that will make sure that if someone is infected, will not develop any severe symptoms. Yeah. And then the, the, the this variant, the XBB 1.5, um, it, I believe it's quickly become the, the sort of uh, dominant strain um, in, in the US. Are we, are we likely to see that happening um, in South Africa too? 
so 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 the right answer it is that we do not know but okay. what we know at the moment we know that in one region of the united states yeah that that is in new york and boston that's in the top as a northeast part of the country, mm. it is become dominating. So what it means around 70% of the genomes that they sequence, they find this variant. In general, in, in the United States, it's only 20%. Yeah. But what we also know is that so far, this variant, even that has been dominated in New York, has not filled the New York hospitals as it had filled with the Omicron last year in December, January, or with the Alpha or the Delta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can see that this variant is not more pathogenic and that the current wall of immunity that both from previous infection and vaccination seems to be holding very well yeah but from south africa is important that we always know what's circulating in south africa so we can act accordingly and at the moment we like to say as scientists we are alerted but we are not concerned about this unique uh, genome that we found in south africa okay prof uh, we appreciate that just just out of interest and this is just me asking why do they have greek names i, I take it you're portuguese from your surname but what do you know why they actually do have these Greek names, Alpha, Delta, Omicron. What's going on? Why is that? That, that, that that's a very interesting question flow because this come a lot from from south africa so for example when we detect the beta uh, variant yeah that was in november 2020 almost uh, two years a year and a half below everyone was calling the south african variant yeah and they were discriminating that was a, 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 <laughs> a activism from the scientists south african scientists are very good activists we have decades of activism experience, especially with HIV AIDS, that we force and we suggest that they get neutral names. And that's a neutral name became the Greek alphabet, what's called Alpha, Beta, Delta, and our current ones, the Omicron. Okay. This current lineage of Omicron, the XBB 1.5, did not got another Greek name because it's still part of the Omicron family. And that's why we are less concern if it was another Greek name. So the World Health Organization, I'm part of the expert panel with 25 scientists yeah, that, that basic decided and advised the World Health Organization when to call another Greek name, another variant of concern, as we had the Delta the beta and the Omicron. And our suggestion is that this one is not very different from Omicron and that do not deserve their own Greek name. Yeah. Um, just in closing, uh, Prof, you know, as I say, I've been following you on uh, social media and, and certainly uh, your tweets are sometimes too scientific for me. But what I wanted to ask was, you know, how um, cautious are you? Or how cautious is your team, you know, when you've picked up something new, when you've picked up a new variant in terms of, you know, announcing it to the public? Because, you know, panic sets in so easily um, you know when it comes to COVID I mean we've seen the devastation in the last two three years that it has caused and and, and so you know justifiably so people sort of uh, panic so what does it take uh, for you to actually say all right it is time to release the statement now okay so so first we we first and foremost we inform our department of health yeah. we also inform the department of science and innovation because they fund the scientific endeavor in South Africa. And then after that, we inform the public at the moment. And then we follow with exactly what I'm doing here. That should make clear that the scientific information, it is informed direct to the public. Yeah. So we do that every week, every week for, for the year, we release a report, which first go to our government and three days days later become public. Yeah. But let me highlight that early identification of variant and pathogens, it really saved lives. Uh, and so, for example, in the last two waves in South Africa of the Omicron and the BA5, our amount of people that died from COVID was much lower because 
once we had that information early, hospitals could be prepared. We could make sure that we have enough oxygen, and we also could make sure that our healthcare water is booster. So early identification of pathogens and variants end up saving life. Unfortunately, with Omicron, there was a big knee-jerk reaction with a travel ban to South Africa. But during that time, we highlighted that that travel ban would be ineffective, and it was. Omicron uh, in, in spread everywhere in the world, and South Africa, in the end, was one of the countries that got the lower number of deaths from Omicron because we could identify very early and prepare to respond. All right. Uh, Prof, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for all the information uh, that uh, you've been giving us and uh, certainly uh, for giving us your time. Many thanks to you, sir.